I had had a uh, really bad tooth infection, an abscess, and between a failed root canal and pulling the tooth and lots of freezing and that sort of thing, um, that seemed to be, in hindsight, the beginning of the end. This is the story of four women who suffer from myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. ME-CFS causes debilitating fatigue that is not improved by rest, and most people with ME-CFS are unable to work. More than 400,000 Canadians have been diagnosed, and that number is only growing. So I'm Dr. Eleanor Stein. I'm a psychiatrist. I work in private practice in Calgary, and my practice is devoted to patients with myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and multiple chemical sensitivity. ME-CFS is really a condition where it feels like you've got the worst flu in the world. So you're, you know, you're so exhausted, you can't get out of bed, you've got a sore throat, your nodes or lymph nodes are swollen, probably not feeling great in your stomach, you might be nauseous, your muscles are exhausted. Um, that's what it feels like every day for someone with this condition. I perform two light tasks per day, but basically, if they're really light, probably two. The cardinal symptom of ME-CFS is often I'll say forgotten or maybe not recognized by most physicians, it's something called post-exertional malaise. And what that means is that after physical, emotional, or cognitive activity, the person's symptoms get a lot worse. I used worse. to be able to vacuum. Okay. Now when I do it, it's just I am totally exhausted. I will be out for the next day, hmm. the rest of the day and the next day. So in addition to fatigue and post-exertional malaise, which are really the two core symptoms, People also have unrefreshing sleep. They often have something they call brain fog, which means they can't think clearly and they get very easily tired when they're trying to think. They often have trouble regulating temperature. They're either too hot or too cold. The worst part was I didn't know what was going on with my body and it was very difficult to get any um, answers or idea from anyone actually what, what was happening to me. But it got to the point where I would be laying on the couch in my house coat until 12, about 11 to 30. I would get dressed, go to school for the afternoon and come back and be right back on the couch. It was very poor quality of life and I struggled to do that for, for a long time because uh, it was just devastating for me to so nicely get back to a job I loved and not to have any idea of what was going on with me. So I tried thinking, I went for a long time thinking if I just rest enough for, you know, that eventually I would get better and I never did. In fact, I got worse. My name is Sharon Doucette and I've had chronic fatigue syndrome for the past eight years. I, I used to be what they call a type A personality. It was go, go, go all the time and my mind was always, um, what next do I got to do? What next do I get done? I've had to sit, learn not that I can't, I can't do everything and anything anymore. The, um, the worst is I have to go to bed. Like I, ha I, can't, I can't keep my eyes open. That is the worst. It's just like, and I just have to lay there like a log. Well, since I've become ill with chronic fatigue syndrome, my husband does all the cooking, uh, cleaning, laundry, grocery shopping. Uh, right now, I, I can go out maybe if two to three times a week for an hour and a half at a time. Uh, and that varies, you know, just when I start f feeling like I'm doing maybe a little bit better, then I uh, sort of crash again on the couch. Right, well personally I've, I've kind of made peace with it, but over the years it's been very difficult. People say, well, princess again, stay at home, husband does the work for you, that kind of thing. Nobody would choose this. That is very, very, very isolating and um, very emotionally draining too because you know how many times can you tell your friends and family well I can't do that in a huge event like a wedding or that kind of thing and sometimes two weeks <laughs> that you're not the same so I'm lucky I can lie down when I can and that helps that it's hard for people to believe but I do have to lie down about every three hours yeah, I'm coming up to my 25th anniversary of having this illness and I would say it's impacted every aspect of my life. It's because of my own experience with the illness and realizing that there was just nobody else out there to help me in terms of professional help. I made the decision about 15 years ago to, to do this professionally and try to learn as much as I can and then pass that on to others. My message is don't give up. 
Um, although we've got a long way to go, even with the tools we have right now around self-management, most people can get a little bit or a lot better. You start cutting out everything that takes too much energy. Uh, dressing, putting my makeup on, doing my hair. I used to try to do a bit of dusting now and then. That's about the extent. On a good day, I can do a little bit of uh, dusting. It, it, it impacts every part of my life. At my worst, it's uh, difficult climbing the stairs. I need to take a break when I go part way up and I walk up very slowly. So that's a gauge for me and how well I'm doing is how um, successfully I navigate the stairs. You know, the doctors and myself don't really mix very well. I had one rheumatologist drag me out to the waiting room and said to me, look at all these people, these people are really sick. So that was very painful. One doctor said I was addicted to doctors. It's not a competition in terms of who's got the worst diseases or the worst situation, but I think at the end of life you have to look back and say, um, this was the cards I was dealt and fight. MECFS really exerts a heavy emotional toll. There's the personal emotional toll, the losses. You used to be a worker, a parent, a spouse, and now you just can't do the things that were important to you and that made you feel valuable in the world. Um, when I do my groups of patients, one of the recurrent themes is lack of purpose. Um, so people are often able to hang on to a sense of meaning but they've lost a sense of purpose because they can't do the stuff that they used to do. It's been really d devastating to go from being an active, uh, hard-working person, connected with people every day, to being alone in my house for many days in a row. So my life has become very quiet. It's often very lonely. There's a sense of isolation. I don't have, I, it's a lack of, um, of control that I feel, that I can't just uh, plan my life and my days and my weeks, whether it's volunteer work or work for pay or hobbies or um, socializing. Everything depends on how I'm feeling and if I have energy to do. I, it, it, it's a lot of limitations. Got rusty just when I was at my worst with the illness. Um, he, was about, he was six months old. When I have a really bad day, when I'm laying flat out on the couch for most of the day, rusty um, he actually seems to know how I'm feeling, so if I'm laying on the couch, he'll join me on the couch and sometimes lay right beside me for quite a long period of time. So he seems to be quite sensitive to how I'm feeling and when I need a, a little bit of extra uh, company or uh, companionship. Stigma is a huge issue in this condition. Most of the patients I see with MECFS complain that they're not believed often by family and friends, and they're not believed by the medical profession. I think the primary reason for the stigma is that you can't prove you have it. It's what we call a hidden disability. The symptoms are subjective. So people on the outside look at someone who has ME-CFS and they look pretty normal. They look just like anyone else. And so it's easy to disbelieve um, the degree of struggle that they have just to get through their daily life. It's really difficult for people with ME-CFS to articulate to others in a way that they can relate to what it's like to have this illness. It really is like living in a cage. If I do mention to people or try to describe what I'm, how I feel and what I'm dealing with, or maybe why I'm not able to attend a certain event or that sort of thing, uh, the common comments are things like, oh, Chronic fatigue. Well, I get that too. I am always t I'm always tired too. There, it's a real misperception. Chronic fatigue syndrome is a devastating physical illness. I think my number one recommendation is that people need to really evaluate all aspects of their life and try to notice what things are making them feel better and what things are making them feel worse and then make changes accordingly. So uh, it, it, it is within the power of anybody with the illness to get a little bit better. Um, most people aren't going to get cured, but almost everybody that I work with can get better than they are when they, when they come in. I don't get to the phone always. People really think that's because I'm being rude or lazy or, or just uh, avoiding them. But the opposite is true. I just have so much energy, and if I've had a very busy day, I can't handle another phone call. I think the ideal 
uh, form of support for really people with any chronic illness is in a group setting because in the group you get validation from the other members and it can really help heal some of the doubt and skepticism that you meet with in other places. Um, when I wrote my manual, I did it with the idea that even if people live in isolated communities or communities where there's no maybe pro professionally led groups, they could use the manual as a guide to help them basically form their own group and work through the material together. The most difficult thing is having a life that you didn't imagine. When I was going to university and, and working, I thought I'd have my 2.2 kids and work full time. But I have a wonderful life. Uh, I'm pretty great. That's the first step I would say, stand up and say, yes, there's something wrong and somebody's got to listen to me. And keep going until you get listened to.